welcome back to our um, uh, London mayoral uh, specials. We're joined now uh, by Dr. Peter Gammons. He's the um, UKIP uh, candidate and you're also a motivational speaker. So first of all, thank you very much uh, for appearing. Uh, we really appreciate you taking your time uh, out of your day. To... Um, before you start, um, obviously you were a motivational speaker. Could you tell us a little bit about your life before politics? Yeah, um, I've done many things. Uh, in, in many things, uh, I have a lot of experience to life. My main thing has been that I've been a Christian inspirational and motivational speaker all over the world, spoken at some of the largest events of history. Uh, and uh, it is actually debatable whether I've actually spoken at the largest event in history. There was an interesting thing where the crowd, which um, we put out that it was a crowd of four million and... Uh, <clears throat> Some people laughed at that, but a smaller crowd in the same location with the Pope, they didn't laugh when the, when the New York Times said there was 7 million there. So a, a smaller crowd than I spoke to, sorry, yeah, a smaller crowd than I spoke to, nobody questioned that there was 7 million there when the Pope was there, but we only said there was 4 million and we had a bigger crowd. And the reason I know is because it was the same organizers. I was speaking for the Catholic charismatic Christians who organized the Pope's visit. And the reason why his crowd was smaller was because it was organized. They had all the roads blocked off. They had all the streets blocked off. They had large areas of security in front of the stage. We didn't, we just had a mass of people. We even actually spread out over the road, over the main motorway. We, the people spread out over the motorway uh, there were people everywhere. The president came to the meeting and had to walk uh, half a mile <clears throat> out of the presidential vehicle because he couldn't get near to the stage because of the crowd. So, yeah, I've, and, and, and I've done things. I've consulted for many politicians. I've been a friend of presidents and world leaders. I've had presidents and, and politicians sent their private jets and helicopters to collect me to help them solve national crises. So, um, I've done a lot in my life. I've, I have experience in banking. I have experience in property development. I have experience in running companies, heading up charities. To, just done just about everything. Done just about everything other than being mayor of London. So I thought, well, let's go. Why not be mayor of London next? <clears throat> when they said to me, uh, would, uh, would you be our candidate for mayor of London? I said, mm, why not? I've, I've never done that one before. <laughs> Yeah, I can't yeah. Hear. All right. yeah. Uh, four million. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of people. And of course, some people might doubt that for reasons. But getting a bit into some some questions yeah, about let, policy. Uh, can I just let, sorry, let me just ahead. say, the, <clears throat> this is not a figure that I pulled out of the sky. This is historically documented. Some some idiot actually said, well, maybe it was the Pope's visit, but it's the pictures are published in a book that I published 16 years before the Pope's visit. So unless you really do believe in amazing miracles, how would I have been able to publish a picture 16 years before it took place? So uh, it, some people think like that, but I don't think like that. I've, I've spoken more than 20 times to crowds over a million people. And, and this is not figures I pulled out of the sky. I have letters from the prime minister, from the police, from the mayor, from the, sec the, the majority leader of the Senate, respected people confirming these figures. It's not, I'm not somebody who invents figures and actually I do underestimate usually, not o overestimate. So anyway, carry on. Hi, my music, yeah. Uh, so just a question quickly here about policy. Um, a report by the BBC showed that across England, 77% of cancer patients starting treatments started treatment within the ideal 62 day timeline and with a and e wait times on the rise and especially in a highly populated city such as london and with a lack of well-paid nurses how would you approach the crisis especially during the pandemic yeah well i, <clears throat> I opposed lockdown all along um we'll never know whether it was a good move or not i i think that more lives will have been lost because of lockdown than because of covid and I think that there's so many people that have gone undiagnosed and untreated during, during this, this lockdown. Different countries of the world have had different responses to it. In America, they 
um, haven't had a lockdown, anything like we've had in England. And things are going on as normal. Sweden, of course, people look at the reports from Sweden. Sweden never did take the route that we took. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> I, think, I, think, I think nurses should be paid much more. I think it's disgusting, the pay rise that was offered to nurses. I think we have to appreciate the um, the NHS, it's a great treasure. I think we have to make sure that we protect it from being privatized. There are those uh, in the Conservative government and others who uh, what would like to see it privatized. I think it would be a very, very big mistake because once you privatize medicine, instead of it being there to save lives, it's there to make money and, and, and prices just rise. I, 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 two of my sons are living and studying in America and I went there and I got pink eye, you know, just a, an eye infection. And uh, I, because I didn't have medical insurance in America, I got a, a $3,000 bill for not even a doctor, just for a nurse looking at my eye and recommending some drops. And they recommended the wrong drops anyway. And, and that's how ridiculous it becomes when you uh, talk about privatizing the NHS. So to sum up what I'm saying, I'm fully supporting of the NHS. I think that, that they're doing a wonderful job. I believe that it's been foolishly handled. I think that the media has shaped people's thinking, but I don't believe that the pandemic has been as horrendous as people have said. You know, the average age of person dying was 82. I don't think that it's really been a, a, a problem facing young people, and yet they're the ones who've been punished most because their studies have been interrupted. And they're the ones who are going to have to pay the taxes in years to come for all the waste. So, yeah, um, you mentioned a lockdown, and you also mentioned the NHS. Have you, or would you, uh, take the coronavirus vaccine? Would I take it? Have you? Yeah, I would. Oh, sorry, yeah, I, I would. I would because I'm old. <laughs> I don't. If I was a young person, to be honest with you, I probably would be very cautious about taking it until I checked what effect it had on other people, but I'm not telling people they shouldn't take it. I do oppose, and, and UKIP, who I'm a candidate for, we oppose, um, we oppose the vaccine passports. We believe that it should be people's personal choice, personal right to uh, decide whether they want it or not. You know, they tell us that the vaccine is to lower the symptoms. It doesn't protect people from getting it. It doesn't protect people from passing it on. It lowers the symptoms. So, okay, if this was going to stop you passing it on, I can see the place for a vaccine passport because then uh, if, you got, if, it's got, if, if you have it and uh, you can't pass it on or you don't have it, you can pass it on. I understand that. But if it's just to lower the symptoms for me, then surely it should be my choice whether I want it or not. By the way, if I don't okay. fully answer the questions, come back at me. Well, I think I think you answered that one um, eloquently. So uh, perhaps we can move on to talk a bit about housing next. I've got a couple of questions yeah. uh, about that. So firstly, uh, in 2020, there were over 10,000 people sleeping rough on the streets of London. How would you fix this uh, homelessness crisis? Yeah, well, if you go to my website, uh, which is just gammons, G-A-M-M-O-N-S dot London. I have a, a solution for homelessness, which I'm already discussing with the homeless charities uh, and, and which I can't say who because during a political campaign, they have to remain politically neutral, but, but have, have said it's a brilliant idea. Okay, in 1940, they had what was the, uh, called the Balham disaster where the Nazis dropped a bomb on, on uh, London and it burst at water mains and many people died in the tubes underground where they were sheltering. So Winston Churchill called for them to construct 10 air raid shelters that could house up to 100,000 people. So these were built, for example, the one at Clapham South. You see this rotunda, it, it just like a round building that's locked up and nobody knows what it is. Everybody's seen this rotunda, but they don't know what it is. It leads down to this, this amazing rooms, which could house up to 8,000 people. So one of my strategies to end homelessness is to turn them into homeless shelters all across London, right in the center of London, where they have ensuite comfortable bedrooms. I'm not talking about piling them all together in a pile underground. 
uh, where they have private bedrooms with showers and restaurants. And that way, the, as I said, they can house up to 100,000. So my solution is that, 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 that if there's 8,000 homeless people across London, no one would ever need to sleep in the cold again. No one would ever need to go without food again. It's not a permanent solution. I'm not talking about a permanent fixture. There needs to be, uh, uh, and, and I support um, at least three, probably four homeless charities every month, even before I was running for mayor. And uh, we need to find permanent solutions because homelessness has many different causes, family background problems. For some, it's an addiction. For some, it's uh, emotional problems. For some, they've been evicted because they couldn't pay their rent. Some people have fallen through the gap. There are many people who, who, who just can't get any benefits from the government. And there are many reasons why. And so thank God for the homeless charities who are looking for solutions. But my solution, I believe, is brilliant. Now, the Greens accuse me of putting people in boxes underground, which is totally ridiculous. And La Labour criticized my policy. And my answer then was, well, you're already in office. Uh, and you're doing nothing about it. There's still hundreds of people sleeping homeless on the street. I prefer my answers, my solutions to your failure to have any answer or solutions. So, and it wouldn't cost, it wouldn't cost the city anything because I would get businesses to finance the whole thing. HSBC, Emirates Airlines, they sponsor many projects and I'm sure they'd be happy to sponsor homeless projects. Yeah, can I move on to the final question on housing as well? Because another problem in London is the rising house prices. And we know that in 2018, 26% of Londoners were renting privately compared to only 11% in 1990. Uh, Terrible, and right, we know that rising housing prices is, is a big factor towards this. How do you think yeah. you could tackle this to make London affordable again for Londoners? Yeah, well, there are a number of things. We need to, we're talking about first renters. We need to protect renters. I've been, I'm a renter and I've been caught in, the, in one of these scams where uh, the, they sublease it and then you discover that you've subleased it from a company who don't actually have the rights to lease it uh, and, and uh, so you have no, no rights as a tenant so I believe we need to protect renters more I believe there needs to be some form of capping on prices for renters there needs to be a greater protection and uh, um, but beyond that I'm looking, and uh, this week I'll be out with my campaign vehicle. Um, looking, I'm looking at over 100 derelict and abandoned sites where we can build. And my plan is to build to start by building 100,000 starter homes at 150,000 pounds, not part ownership like Sean Bailey's promoting. What is it? Uh, however many for, for 100,000, but what he's not honestly telling people is that they're only gonna own a, a small percentage or a part of that house. The developers will own most of it. I'm looking to build small starter homes where people will have outright ownership around the 150,000 mark. And some people say, well, developers, they only, developers just wanna build big expensive houses where they quickly make millions from it. Well, as mayor, I'm gonna limit their ability to do that. If they want to build these luxury homes, they can, but they have to build a certain number of affordable houses. And what I, the way I define affordable is different to the way Labour and Conservative define affordable. I mean, truly affordable. This is very important to me because so many children of Londoners are having to leave London because they can't afford to live here. And so I, I'm fighting especially for people to get starter homes for singles and young couples to get them started. And then well, as they earn money and they grow up with their families, they'll be able to buy two, three, four bedroom houses and things like that one hopes. And then these ones will become available for the next lot of starter homes. And um, so it's to get people on the property property ladder. They, well, they won't be big. They may, you know, some of, some of the parties, I believe the Greens and Liberals, they're like the houses have to be a certain size, whatever. I don't know about you, you, you fellas, but for me, I'd rather have a smaller place that belonged to me than a bigger place that I was renting. So I'm trying to get people on the property ladder. Yeah, housing obviously is some an issue that's arisen a lot in London over the past 10 years, specifically, yeah. I think. 
but uh, a question there about the European Parliament. Um, in the 2019 European elections, you turned down the chance to be an MEP candidate and apparently was offered the leadership of an unspecified party. So which party was this and why did you turn down the chance to run for European Parliament? Um, this, this was never a site that I put up. This site was not put up by me. I have, I, I, I have once seen it. It was, it was a friend of mine who had access to my photos. I gave him access to my photos to put something up for my kids during lockdown. And so this was his reminiscence of stories that I'd told. I, I, um, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't run. Um, it wasn't, it, it, no, it was for the, for the government, it was for, for, uh, for MPs in, in England. It wasn't for the MEP. I didn't, I, I was never offered to run as an MEP. And uh, the party, it's an interesting story, but it's something that I'm not going to talk about because uh, as I said, I didn't put up that website personally. Uh, it was something my friend did that only my kids should have seen. And I don't know if somebody hacked into it or how after my, 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 my sons are studying and we'd been a, apart for a year. Joshi is 19 and, and Peter's 20. And uh, they saw it and they're like, wow, dad, that's really cool. And he told lots of stories that they didn't know. They didn't know of the properties I developed. They didn't know lots of the stories. And 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 uh, so, so they they loved it. And then I told him take it down. There was a few about three mistakes he made in there. And and originally I was going to say correct them, but I said don't bother, just get it down. And I and so I I thought no one but my sons would ever see that site, just so that they knew what their dad had done. But but uh, there are things on there that that I have nothing to be ashamed of. But there are things on there that that. I, I could get mileage out of. I don't know if you've seen that site with all the celebrities that that that, that I've uh, known or been friends with or encountered over the years. You know, it's like a who's who of famous people. But I have throughout the whole campaign, I haven't pushed that or or done that. I haven't talked about all the things I've accomplished, and uh, uh, because this is not about me, it's a campaign about what what about London and Londoners. My whole campaign is to fight, for, especially working class Londoners, people who are disadvantaged, people who uh, um, are taken advantage of, especially things like uh, people who can't afford to just go out and buy a new electric car. Um, and uh, so they're penalized every day. They get ULEZ and, and congestion charge fines because they're poor. And that's what I'm angry about. That's what I'm fighting for, for ordinary Londoners who are being discriminated against purely, simply because they're poor. Yeah, um, I have to ask like about that. You um, in the past have called for UKIP to become like a centre-right party. Do you think the centre-right will get behind UKIP after some of the past remarks and candidates such as Paul Joseph Watson, a far-right conspiracy theorist, Carl Benjamin, a YouTuber who thinks it's funny to joke about rape, as well as using many racist slurs in the past. You have also hired Tommy Robinson as an advisor in the past, who refers to as Muslims, and I quote, Muz rats. And um, I'm just going to read you one of his tweets. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I can never even, I, I, I'm not a fan of his. I always call, I, I can never remember whether it's Tommy Robin or Tommy Robinson. I, I have little interest in him. I'm not, I don't support, you know, you can, you can quote all these people who have been in the party before, but none of them are here anymore in the party. Uh, so if you've got a quotes from people that are still in the party, then then tell me. But these people are people who I agree with things they've said. I don't support things they've said, and it in no way influences my own views on things. I'm very center right, center. I don't even call, I personally don't even refer to myself as center right. I'm just right in the center. My mother voted labor, my, my father voted liberal, and most of the rest of the family voted conservative. So. Politically, I saw the best and the worst of every party. And so I have no time for extremists, including extremists who have been in, in the party before, but every party has them. You know, um, uh, you look at the Labour Party, you've got a thousand uh, uh, black active uh, supporters who refuse to campaign because of racism in the Labour Party. You, 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 in, you have a prime minister at the moment who referred to 
uh, black people as having watermelon smiles and all kinds of other uh, insults. Caught, use the word Nigerian insulting. So every party has racism in it and things like that. Don't just single out UKIP. UKIP has had people who have said many things that I certainly do not like or would not agree with, but they're gone now. So thank God for that. And, and I can only be judged by what I say and what I believe and what I do. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to read you uh, something from UKIP's website. So it says asylum. Uh, so one of their one of the policies from the latest manifesto is asylum uh, will not be granted to migrants who have entered the UK illegally from safe countries like France, Belgium, or Ireland. This um, this could go against Article uh, 14 of the U UN Human Rights Convention. Um, does the UKIP support hu human rights for everyone? Yeah. Well. Uh... I can't, I'm not, I can't really speak on behalf of UKIP. I'm not even part of the leadership of UKIP. I'm their mayoral candidate. I certainly support human rights for everyone. What you're reading is that their, their policy is the same policy that the Conservative Party have, that it's not about migrants, it's about economic migrants, where there's a difference. We're not talking about refugees from whose lives are in danger. We're talking about people who have come and they are the ones that have broken the law because they've come through other European countries to get here. European law states that you have to stay in the first, if you want to claim uh, residence, you have to stay in the first European country you enter. And many of these are people who've traveled through Italy, through France to get to Britain because there's better benefits in Britain. And, and so, but, but for me, I, my, I have a heart for people, I actually have, working on my London team, two lawyers to help people whose paperwork's not in order to, to get their papers in order so that they can become British citizens or, or, or get the paperwork so that they can stay in Britain. I have a big heart for, for people who, who are disadvantaged. And uh, because I've been a minister, um, I care about anybody who, who, who uh, is um, disadvantaged and needs help. But the, reality, but the reality is uh, some, of, uh, some of the issues that, that, that some of the members of UKIP are fighting are not issues that I'm fighting. I'm fighting for ordinary working class Londoners. So, so you know, it's, when we, you talk to me about housing, you have to take into consideration that if every year 400,000 new people or 300 and something thousand new people come to Britain, how are we going to house them when, for example, in London, there's 800 thousand people on the waiting list for social housing and i'm not talking about race. this is not about race this is about space this is about how do we house the people already who can't we can't house how we have a hospital system where people are waiting two years to get an operation two three years to get an operation either we're going to have to have lots more hospitals we're going to have to have uh, lots more higher taxes to pay for this so UKIP is not against not not pro against uh, immigration. It's for controlled immigration and a certain number every year coming into the country that is manageable, so that we can provide them with housing, we can provide them with uh, hospitals, we can we can care for them. Thank you. Can I talk now a bit about crime because this is a really serious issue in London at the moment. It's something that affects all Londoners, especially people from the working class. We know that according to Met statistics, Sadiq Khan's tenure as mayor has overseen the number of uh, annual crime offences nearly double. Uh, and we know that the numbers are rising at a rate six times faster than the rate of the country. So what are your policies for tackling this uh, epidemic of crime once and for all? Well, the first thing is I'm gonna open uh, police substations in every, in every area every town, there will be police presence there. I'll have police out on the street, on the beat, talking, meeting with people, uh, because I believe that the police have distanced themselves from the people. People have failed to realize that the police are there for them. The, the anti-lockdown protests, we've seen violence from the police. We've seen double standard policing where some events they back off, others they go in with uh, riot gear. And, and I think that people in London have lost confidence in the police. Uh, I think the police commissioner needs to resign and I think we need somebody new and I think the police need to be talked to. Because you see, once you take the uniform off a policeman, you have an ordinary person. 
the power they have is not in them. The power is invested in them and the uniform they wear. They are there to serve the people, but they are the people serving the people. We, we are supposed to believe in that in England. So you cannot have the police going in and acting violently with people who are peacefully protesting. Now, obviously, if, if people become violent, then the police have to protect themselves. But uh, so I think we need the police on the beat, out with the people in the communities. We don't need people, if the crime's committed or if they suspect a crime's going to be committed, having to call uh, call up to, to a central location in London. So get the police back in the communities, get the police on the beat, tough on crime, people caught with knives, serious offence, deal strictly with it. Uh, I'm looking to, to drastically increase the number of police. I believe that we need police that reflect the ethnicity of certain areas as well. For example, I personally oppose, uh, you know, like three white policemen searching, stop and search a black kid. It causes racial tension and it causes uh, disruption. I think that, that we need to recruit far more from the different groups in London so that the policing are representative of the people that they're policing. Um, I think that there, there are many ideas that I have, but I haven't fully developed the potential of them to basically have the police much more living in the communities they're serving. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we have to re-educate the police how to deal with people. And we have to educate the people that the police are there for them because, uh, you know, for example, stop and search is important because every mother who opposes it, it might be her son who's the next victim. But the way it's done, for example, I, I personally encourage the use of handheld wands like they use to, in, in airports rather than, you know, emptying pockets or, or, or whatever, whatever other methods that are used, the police putting their hands in people's pockets. I, I personally think it's a much less invasive method. So I think we need to, we, there needs to be a whole new look at policing in London. And, and certainly uh, I don't believe that Sadiq Khan or Crescenda Dick are handling it correctly. Uh, yeah, a question on your um, green policies. Um, on January 29th, the government signed off a plan which opposed the station of airports and the third runway. On UIP's website, you state that keeping London green is an important policy, saying London's to move forward economically while ensuring a green and sustainable future. You also say that we need to restart our economy, but taking this into consideration, are you for or against the plans to expand Heathrow, knowing that backing it would damage your green ideas? Mm. I haven't studied it myself, and you caught me off guard there with that question. My own green policies that, 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 that I promote are 10 new parks in London, million new trees with my plant a tree by 23. And, and uh, I haven't read the report on the expansion of Heathrow. Obviously, uh, I will. Um, uh, yeah, it's one I, can't really com one I can't really comment on because I have, haven't reviewed the, the reason for the government's decision. I think we have. I think it has to be balanced. I think that you know we, we, we have to balance ecological issues with making people's lives uh, uh, livable. You know, for example, banning people or punishing them because they can't afford to grow buy a new electric car. I think is wrong um, because uh, the, the the rich it doesn't bother them. They can just go out tomorrow and buy a new Tesla but your average Londoner cannot afford to do that. And so they get hit with congestion charges uh, every, and then they get hit with ULES charges. And, and so the poorer families are the only ones who are suffering. And realistically, the green uh, strategies like the green so-called electric taxes are, are far from developed yet. They do about 30 miles. Some of them might get 50 if they don't have the heating on or they don't have uh, the radio on or, or the air conditioning on. They do between 30 to 50 miles before they switch back to diesel. And then they take an hour to, charge, to, to recharge them. And so we're pushing this agenda on people. They can't even do a trip to, to Heathrow and back without on, on electric. And most of the electrics produced by 
fossil fuels anyway. So, so I do believe in a green agenda. As I said, I'm, I support a number of charities, uh, um, CPRE and others. I support them every month. And uh, I, I support the concept for 10 new parks here, protecting our green space. But there has to be a development as well. For example, the talk about expanding the, the uh, um, congestion zone is going to turn, there was a plan for Heathrow to be the hub for uh, businesses, uh, to, uh, the largest in the world where come for cargo. And so we have to decide whether the green policies to protect the green space or whether we're going to be an economic force in the world. We can't have it both ways. Uh, you know, and, and the batteries, for example, in the electric cars, you, you have to do 37,000 miles before you're saving with, with petrol cars for the first 37 miles produce less CO2 than electric vehicles do. It's only after 37,000 miles that you're actually making a difference to, to the environment. And so um, we're pushing through environmental issues, which I believe in, but I think that there are, if we push it through too soon when it's undeveloped, we get everybody out buying these vehicles, the hybrids that, that are gonna be useless in three or four years time. And nobody's looked at what we're going to do with these batteries and the the the, the uh, environmental issues. Nobody's looking at the fact that the universe, the planet, uh, it doesn't matter where you do it. it it's it, it's going to affect um, the whole world. For example, the batteries are produced in China, so they produce five times the CO two producing these electric batteries than a car than than for a petrol car. So we have to look at all of the these issues, take them into account not be reactionary where we're going to try and force everything through immediately and and we have to look at the fours and the against the expansion of Heathrow we have to look at the fours and the against and and uh, one of the things as mayor I will um, push through referendums so we discover what people want because I believe that politicians should be there to represent the people not to force their views on the people and and secondly to, to do environmental studies and to do studies to find out the damage compared to the benefits. Because what we don't want to do is drive England back to the Stone Age, which is one of the things that, that we, we may not produce these, these things for environmental reasons, but we're forcing other countries to produce them. Yeah. Um, finally, after I agree... really... okay. Yeah, I'm going to have to take a shot. Carry on, carry on. It's fine. No, that's fine. All right, all right. Um, after going some for, uh, uh, let me let me just try and speak again. Okay, after going some through some prior material of yours, found you profess to have healed people in the past, such as one account claiming you healed fourteen thousand people at one time. Are you concerned that people may be skeptical of these claims and uh, maybe putting putting uh, putting them off voting for you? And do you have a message for them? Yeah, well, I've never claimed to heal anybody. I don't claim to heal anybody. I don't have any healing powers. I have been a church minister and I prayed for people and people have claimed that they've been healed. People have claimed that, that they've uh, recovered. The, answer, the Ultimately, it'll depend on whether you believe in prayer or not. If you believe in, in God, if you believe that God has power to heal, if you believe in prayer, then that's acceptable. If you don't, then, then whatever happens, even if something happens right in front of your eyes, you're not going to believe it. I remember one, one doctor who said, uh, even if uh, there was no other explanation, I would not believe that God had done it. And so if you are an atheist, then you, you will have no excuse. But the bottom line is I believe in prayer. I believe in God. I believe God can heal. I am not a healer. I have never claimed to be a healer. It really annoys me when people make that accusation against me. Most of them are referring to things on the web that have nothing to do with me. Other people have put them up there. Um, but and again, when you talk about this 14,000 people, what you have to take into consideration is that there was, uh, I think it was 60,000 had gone through that event over six days. No, let me let me think. No, no, no. There was 60,000 people a night attending the event for six nights, which is. Um, what is it, 360,000 people. So 14,000 people claiming that they had been healed and answered to prayer is, is uh, not surprising. Just give me one second.
Yeah, these are these are not wild claims. These 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 are, are a combination of letters from people that have written. They're all handwritten letters from people claiming that they were healed in answer to prayer. These are medical forms. I, I actually have doctors who have attended the events and checked people, but uh, I, I, we couldn't afford to do that all the time because I'm not interested in, in anything that's, I'm not interested in anything that's uh, sensational. I'm interested in re reality. If there really has been an answer to prayer, and if there has, then let's let the world know that Jesus is the same today and he can still heal. Sorry, there wasn't enough time in the Zoom meeting to finish the intro, outro, sorry. Uh, so I'm just going to do it now. Thank you so much to Peter Gammons uh, for coming on. Thanks to Tommy and Cameron, of course. Um, thank you to yourself for watching this. Um, there is a Brian Rose update on all our other social media pages. So that's where that has gone just do check there, and we're still working on it. Um, I will get back to you ASAP on what's happening. So thank you very much, and give it a like and subscribe.